Hello and welcome back to Strathpeffer Junction. Today's video is taking a look at the Hormi Class 20. Uh, this is the one in the Derby Technical Centre livery, um, which is one of my favourite liveries actually, and I, I tend to, to collect the, anything to do with departmental stock. Um, but we're going to have a look anyway at the, the Class 20. It's not really a review, it's just a, a very quick overview of it. Uh, and then installing the uh, TTS chip into it. So this is Hornby's Class 20 TTS chip. Um, so I'm not going to linger too much because I, I've done a few of these before and chip installation tends to be fairly similar, albeit there are some differences between models. But we'll install the 8-pin chip into the 8-pin uh, Hornby Class 20. Uh, but the speaker that comes with this is pretty naff, really. So uh, I'm going to replace this for a slightly better speaker and install it into, into the body. Now, the, the one thing which is a positive, really, about the Hornby Class 20s is that there is a reasonable amount of room for some speaker options in it. The Bachmann Class 20, which is, a, I think, a superior model in terms of detailing, um, it is, well, superior in terms of detailing really isn't in terms of internal space. And there is very, very little space to get a speaker in other than the stock speaker. And even the stock speaker can be a bit of a push. So that's a positive. We'll move on anyway now. We'll look at uh, installing the chip and the speaker and a quick look at the, the actual logo itself. Okay, so the, the Loco comes in Hornby's fairly standard uh, standard packaging. Um, it comes with the, the little strip across the front, which actually, I, I know they and other manufacturers do that, but in some respects it's a shame because you don't really see the locomotive in its, uh, its full glory. Uh, but it's only packaging, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's the details there for uh, anybody who's, uh, who's interested in this particular model. It's R2763. So we'll pop that to one side. Now, Hornby still tend to use for some of their locomotives the, the polystyrene. Um, some people prefer it to the blocks of ice, others don't. Um, but there you have it, this is what we've got this time. Um, with a lot of the, the Hornby locomotives, you'll, you'll get a little bit of information about adding a, a DCC chip to it. Uh, and they often supply you with a, a little sleeve of, of plastic. Um, I don't know if it's heat shrink, I, I suspect it's probably not, but uh, just to, to insulate that decoder. Um, so we, we might use that later on, or I often like to use capped on tape as well. Um, and capped on tape, just to, uh, just to mention, it's, it's a tape that uh, is not an insulating tape. Uh, in terms, sorry, it's not a thermal insulating tape. So if you wrap capped on tape around the decoder, it should still allow heat uh, to dissipate through it, which is unlike uh, electrician's tape, which tends to, to hold heat a bit closer. But anyway, we'll move on to that. We'll move on and we'll, we'll maybe touch on that again later on. And of course, we, we've got the instructions uh, which come with just about any locomotive these days. It tells you about uh, running it in before DCCing it, uh, you know, general maintenance, how to take the body apart and all that jazz. So we'll pop that to one side anyway uh, and we'll, we'll see what we've got in the package itself. So in the, the package itself, we have, of course, the locomotive. Um, Hornby provide normally a little, uh, a, a little hole in the back so you can help to, to ease it through. Some of the, the Lima um, packaging didn't have that and it could actually be quite easy with some models to, to damage the loco when you're taking it out. But anyway, easy enough to do in this particular one. Uh, now, because this is uh, pretty much new in box, it does come with its original tissue paper, but it looks like a mouse has maybe been at it. Um, but anyway, we'll take that off to one side, and there we have it in all of its glory. Um, this, uh, sorry, this fabulous Class 20. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I have a few Bachman Class 20s, which I love. They're, they're really beautiful models. This is the only Hornby one that I've, I've bought because I, I don't think their detailing is really up to it. But um, I think this particular one um, with the, the, the technical services livery is just a beautiful one. Um, and uh, with a little bit of weathering, which I plan to do, do in due course, and a bit of extra detail, I think it'll brush up uh, really nicely. So anyway, let's have a, a quick look at the, the model itself. Okay, well, as I say, it really is a pretty stunning, uh, stunning model, particularly I think it was originally based on, on a Lima model um, and has then been uh, given a bit of a facelift from, from Hornby. Um, now, when Lima did it, it was actually one of their better locomotives. It had a can motor in it rather than the ring field uh, and was actually you know, a pretty, pretty good valued model for, for what you got for your money. Um, and, and Hornby's, yeah, it's, it's not a bad one either. It isn't as good, I don't think, as Bachmann's motors, uh, but it, it works really well. Um, now, this one is a domino head code uh, version. There are ones that uh, have the, the numbers uh, in, the, in the head code box. 
Um, but this one has been converted into the lights as we can see here. Um, we've got the cab area as well. The detailing tends to be uh, molded uh, in these Hornby ones. So while we've got an individually applied handrail, which is a really nice touch, um, all the other sections around here, um, along the side here and so on, uh, are, are molded in detail. But it's not bad, it looks all right. Uh, the buffers are not sprung, but you wouldn't expect that on this particular one. Uh, the nice upgrade that you, you get on the, the Hornby ones here uh, is that they, they do have a, a NEM pocket, which is brilliant because I, I use KDs, so I'll be able to change those. Um, the livery itself is really crisp, it's nicely done. I had thought about buying a Bachman and respraying it, but really the livery on this, the application is brilliant, so I, I, I won't do that, I have no need now. On the front here, we have... Uh, Again, the Domino Headco box. We've got a slight uh, high intensity headlight. Uh, not the best detailing, this one. Um, it's uh, it's not very realistic. It doesn't have a lens in it. Um, and it's the same with the other lights, actually. They're not brilliant. Now, you could you could drill them out, um, as I've done with uh, a Lima um, on uh, a Lima 47, which I've been, I've been upgrading, and I've got a final part to come soon on that. Uh, but I think I'm not going to bother in this one. I don't think... Uh, drilling all of these lights and adding um, adding real lights would really add much value. Certainly not financially, I don't think. Um, maybe a wee bit, uh, but I don't think it would add much value in terms of aesthetics and, and joy of use. Uh, but there is also some buffer beam detail, not very much. The hook is moulded on here, um, which with a bit of weathering and from a distance, it won't look it won't look too bad. The grill detail actually on the top here now. Um, it's, it is moulded grill detail, uh, but it's been done really pretty well. Um, it, it really doesn't look too bad at all, uh, which is a, a really nice surprise. There's also with the exhausts here, which actually do go through, so that might well help with sound dissipation when we get the, the, chip, the chip in in due course. Uh, at the rear of the cab here, um, we have got the window details and there's uh, open cab windows and uh, the closed window. Now, in some respects, that is a nice touch to have the open one. If you wanted to put a driver in, they could have their hand waving out the window or, or whatever. Um, but what it also does disclose is the thickness of the, the moulded piece here. Um, and the glazing bar is really, it, it's really pretty thick. And if you're thinking about scale, mm, it's maybe not that far off a foot thick, which is clearly not the case at all. Uh, in, in terms of you know, how thick it would be in real life. Many people won't be that bothered, but uh, I, I do like some of those little details to be as close as possible uh, within the realms of possibility with a plastic model. So anyway, maybe a slight uh, half mark off there, but not, not really a biggie. But uh, in terms of the detail on the, the actual frame and the chassis of the Loco, it's not great. Uh, the bogies are not totally accurate. Um, and uh, they're very they're very light. It's just moldy detail. Nothing that's uh, that's individually applied. I think this is probably the battery box here. I'm not entirely sure, but this is quite poor. Um, it is just a, a kind of facade, really, because the underneath here, this section comes out with the chassis. So. Uh, it's not brilliant, but again, with a bit of weathering uh, and detailing, it can probably be improved to the extent that really you won't notice it too much. But it, it is it's definitely a throwback to the Lima days and, and reflective of the actual price point. Um, but in terms of the, the weight of the Loco, the, there's a good weight to this one. It's not light like often the, the Lima and not Hornby ring fields are. Uh, it really does have a good weight, which is going to be good for traction. Uh, and once we get that lid off and we have a look inside, we'll be able to see that we've got a powered boat we've got a can motor uh, and it's uh, it's it is it is a, a good loco despite coming from uh, fairly humble beginnings okay so um, I've turned the look upside down I've got my servicing cradle out just to protect the the livery detail um, what I'm gonna do first is remove the uh, the couplings now Firstly, I find that these tension lock ones can be a bit of a pain and just get in the way of what you're doing. So I like to take them off and, and pop them to one side. But also, as I probably mentioned in just about every video now that I do, uh, where I'm having a look at a locomotive, I don't use tension locks if I can help it. I normally use KDs. So um, I, I've removed those and I'll not be replacing them. Now, the, the one thing which is quite nice about uh, the, the kind of legacy from Lima is that on these class 20s, the, the way you get into them is to pop off the buffers and then the body comes away. So there's no fiddling about with screws and clips and lots of other things which can sometimes be quite an issue. However, the one thing I have noticed is that uh, on this one and on the, the odd one or two that I've serviced for friends in the past, 
uh, sometimes the buffers can actually be pretty locked in place um, and it can be quite hard to pull them out without doing some damage. Um, now I have tried to take these off myself just quickly uh, before I press the record button uh, and sadly uh, these feel pretty locked in place. So uh, I've got um, a pair of tweezers here which have got rubber ends to them. So I'm going to use these to see if I can just loosen and move them about a little bit uh, and hope that that will free free them up and enable me to pull them out. It might be that the, the plastic is just a little bit tight and that interference, interference fit is, uh, well, it's interfering too much. <laughs> or it might be that the, the paint has maybe a lock, or there might be another reason. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can use these just to very gently move these Right. Okay, there's a little bit of movement, but not very much. Right, um, just so that you don't uh, see any electric blue air if things go wrong, I'm going to press pause just now in the video and uh, I'm going to go and loosen these off and get them open and we'll come back when they're removed and we're ready to rock. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the four buffer details out now. Um, I have to say that having praised in the past uh, Lima for their innovative and very easy to remove system, uh, if they're not easy to remove, it's actually a bit of a pig. And I don't know if you can you can see here on my finger, but it's actually pretty sore getting enough grip on that to, to twist them. So do be careful, but uh, do be patient because it'd be very easy to snap them as well. And uh, I don't think we'll be getting replacements from Hornby or Lima. Anyway, right, so we've got those, those, uh, those out now. So what we need to do is to just very carefully prise the body apart now. Um, normally it should just, should just lift off. Um, let's give it a wee shot here. The instructions actually, I have for the first time in a while reverted to the instructions and they do seem to suggest that you prise this open and pull them down. But, oh, there we go. Excellent. There we go. Well, once you actually get that apart, it comes apart really quite easily, but um, yeah, I can see the issue here. There's two little pips either side there, um, and it's not glue, but they've got something just slightly tacky. I don't know whether maybe in the factory they pop something onto it just to, to hold it together, a kind of uh, a non super glue type of adhesive. But uh, anyway, it's out now. That was a wee bit of a battle, uh, but we've got there. So now we can we can move on to having a look at the chassis itself. Actually, just before we move on to the chassis, I just wanted to have a, a quick mention uh, just about the, the lights. Now, as I, as I touched on earlier, the lights themselves are non-functioning. They're just painted on. Um, if you wanted to, to, to convert these, and then looking at it here, you could drill all the way through and then perhaps pop some LEDs on the inside. Um, for the yeah, for the head code one, it looks like this section here is probably separately, I'll pop it down here, it looks like this section here is probably separately applied, the actual box, and you might be able to pop or drill out the, the plastic rivets on the inside, but um, as I say, I'm not convinced, while it's perfectly doable, I'm not convinced it's worth doing on this model unless you really wanted it. And uh, I, I think for, for what I want, then this will be absolutely this will be absolutely fine without lighting. Right, so we're finally inside. Uh, and as we can see, we've got uh, the front at the, here, we've got the front powered bogey. Um, and that comes on a, a shaft through to the can motor here, which is a fairly typical can motor in terms of model railways. Uh, generally, but uh, in terms of these original Lima and uh, more recently Hornby, this is slightly novel. You know, it's definitely it's definitely uh, better than than uh, some of the offerings that we have from them. We have an, an eight pin chip plug here, um, which is ideal. It means that we won't have to do any wiring. The the TTS sound decoder will plug straight in without any problem. And we have got some fairly generous space in the back here to to get a speaker in and to get a reasonable speaker. So what I'm going to try to do is to to fit in. Oh, oh, and just before we quickly move on, we've also got nothing in the body here that which would inhibit a, a speaker as well. And it's open actually right through to, to, uh, to here. So what we might want to do is fit in a bit of plastic card or something here, uh, just so the speaker isn't visible from anyone peering in the window. Um, but uh, largely that's gonna come down to what speaker we actually put in and uh, how visible it is. But no, plenty of room to play with. You should be able to, to do something better than the stock TTS speaker. So talking of the, the stock TTS speaker, um, here we have the 
TTS Class 20 uh, from Hornby. It's actually a pretty reasonable chip, this. The, the, the sound project which they've installed in it, it's not too bad at all. It's got uh, a fairly good um, reproduction of that really classic uh, noise that you get off the, I assume it will be the, the turbo on the diesel engine. Um, that kind of chopper noise, hence the hence the um, the nickname. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty decent chip. As as with all the TTS chips, it's limited in terms of what it can actually do. If you're really into a lot of computer control and braking and all that kind of stuff, or auto braking, uh, but it's it's not a bad it's not a bad one at all. And for this particular loco, I just want it to be tootling around perhaps the yard or parts of the layout in due course, pulling some uh, some departmental stock. So this will be absolutely fine for that. So I've made a head start and opened the packaging. What do we get in it? Well, we get all the standard bump that you get with a TTS uh, chip from Hornby. You get the instructions, um, which are actually pretty decent. Um, they run through um, all the functions. They run through some of the different settings. So sometimes you'll find that in terms of the way that it handles or delivers the power uh, to the motor, that it's not as good as it can be. So it talks you through how you can tweak that so that it'll run as smoothly as possible. Um, you get all of the, the normal warranty and other bump. Uh, you get the stock speaker, you get the chip, you get it all in this blister pack, uh, which is, well, I think it's I think it's over packaging and I know in this day and age we, we tend to have everything packaged to within an inch of its life, um, but uh, it doesn't need to be this much. Anyway, pop all that to one side. Um, we've got the chip, we've got an anti-static bag, and we have some little fixing screws. But we're not gonna need the screws uh, because we won't be using this enclosure, so we'll pop that to the side. Um, and what I'm gonna move on to now is looking at the alternative speaker to this one. Um, and then once we've got that soldered up, we've got it installed, then we can give it a bit of a shot on the track. But anyway, first step, let's change the speaker. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is um, take off this speaker, I'll just desolder or cut very close back the, the wires. Um, and I've got a couple of different speakers here which I'm gonna try and fit in. I have this uh, sort of small mega bass uh, type speaker and I have this uh, bass reflex speaker, another kind of mini one. Now both of these will fit in. This one will need a little bit of work to its enclosure to make it fit in. And this one will need a little bit of work to its enclosure and also to the chassis to file down to fit in. So I'm gonna see um, what is likely to, to work best. But before I try that, what I'll do is wire both of them up to the chip just to see which sounds best. Because if this sounds rubbish, I'm not gonna bother pursuing and I'll, I'll make this one fit. Uh, but if this one feels, uh, feels uh, sounds and feels uh, reasonably decent, and I'll probably go with this one because this one uh, is more invasive in terms of having to mill out part of the chassis. Um, and while I do like to get a really good sound, I also like to not uh, destroy too much of the locomotive in the process. So um, I'm gonna wire these up anyway and give them both a little test and, and just see what we're looking at in terms of sound before we move, uh, move on to the destructive part of, of the installation. Okay, so I have rigged up the small bass reflex speaker to the TTS chip and into my ESU decoder, which I covered in an earlier video. Um, I've given it a quick test run just now, and actually I think the, the uh, sound coming out of this is really pretty decent for what it is. So I think I'll stick with this, which requires less intervention on the chassis itself. But I'll give you a, a quick shot anyway, just now, just so you can hear what it's like. Uh, so here we go. So um, I think you'll probably agree that for such a tiny little speaker like this, it's really getting quite a good amount of that kind of kind of low pitch kind of growl that, that you get from these particular diesel locos. So I'm going to stick with this this speaker. Um, hopefully, it's coming across okay in the, the the video. I know that recording it requires a decent mic, and then it requires. Uh, you know, a good set of speakers on the other side, so it might not be picking everything up, but it's a pretty good result, I think. So I'm going to prepare this anyway. I'll get the uh, the cables all cut down to length, 
um, I've got to take off these little lugs from either side and I've got to file down a few little bits in the, the side of the speaker just to make it fit snugly. Um, but fingers crossed anyway that uh, it'll, it'll be a good match for this particular decoder. And one thing just to mention and it's really important to note is that the, the TTS speakers, I'll pop that off so you can hear me, the TTS speakers require an 8 ohm speaker. So not a 100 ohm like the old ESU 3.5s lock sounds, not a 4 ohm like some of the, the newer lock sounds or some of the Zemo decoders can take it's got to be 8 ohms so you can either do that with a single 8 ohm speaker like I've got here or if you've got two 4 ohm speakers you can run them in series to get 8 ohms anyway just a reminder that if you don't put in the right speaker if you put in a 4 ohm speaker it'll probably blow up the chips and make sure it's 8 ohms right okay anyway onwards Okay, so I thought I'd just quickly show you what I'm doing to prepare this particular speaker for the Class 20 body. Um, I'm just cutting off the lugs on the end here, I've done one already. Now you can probably use snips to snip it, but I find it they tend to leave a bit of a raggedy edge. So I've just used this modelling saw uh, and all I need to do is, is kind of get in there. So I'll come around to the other side. This one's a wee bit trickier because of the cable. So. Start at the top. But anyway, just simply back to forwards. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really need to show you how to saw. But anyway, that's what I do anyway, just to, to get this off. So I'll come back rather than making you sit through all of my sawing. I'll come back and finish that off. The other thing that you need to do to make this fit into the class twenty is just put a bevel uh, on either side of these. So what I will, or either side of the enclosure. So what I'm going to do is just to get a file and file a bevel along there. Now there's probably only at most about a millimetre of plastic that we can take away probably half that actually so I, I haven't done it yet and I've not done it before for this but um, I'll just take it slowly and work my set way backs and forwards uh, just uh, until I've got enough off but uh, leaving plastic there. If you do happen to go through and make a hole in the sound box it's fairly easy to fix all you need to do is get a tiny bit of plastic hard a tiny bit of solvent cement um, and mix it up into a sort of slurry and if it's a small hole you just drag it across the top of that hole and it'll set and close it. If it's a slightly bigger hole, just get a, a, a long sliver of plastic card, uh, lay it across and apply the solvent slurry, same kind of way. So it's not the end of the world as long as you haven't destroyed the entire enclosure. So I'll can't and continue chopping this off, I'll uh, file this down and then we'll come back to the next stage which will be fitting this in the body and also wiring it up the decoder itself. Okie dokie. Right, so I was using a file and then I suddenly thought mm, if I get a flat surface and some sandpaper it might actually be a wee bit easier and indeed it is. So I've got this old sanding disc here which is no use for what it uh, was originally for but it's a kind of medium grit. I don't know if it says on it what it is. No, it's got some funny... No. Anyway, it's a medium grit uh, and all I've been doing is holding it um, you know, square like that and just rubbing it back and forwards um, and that puts on a nice... Uh, a nice um, consistent bevel, I guess, is the right way to describe it, from one side to another, and we'll see if I can, can show you here. Um, so we're getting that nice bevel, and that bevel will cut, fit in with the contours of the, the body of the Class 20, uh, so it can sit as close up into the roof as it possibly can, um, because while this fits, it only just fits, uh, and that should make it nice and snug without anything getting squashed or the body not fitting back properly. So I'll continue doing that, I'll continue beveling the edges, I'll probably take off maybe, um, I don't know, a, a fraction of a centimetre anyway off the actual bottom there, just so we've not got any more plastic than we actually need, and then we'll be able to fit it snugly into the, the top of the body. Okay, so I've finished filing, and like I said, I've put a bevel down either side, and I've filed a, a small amount off the, the bottom of the speaker as well. And what that has enabled me to do is to get the speaker uh, seated in the roof of the, the, the body, so the, the underside of the roof, if you like. Um, and what I've done is, um, just temporarily, I've popped uh, two blobs of, of black tack to hold it in place. I did a kind of dry fit. Well, not, well, it's not a dry fix, I'm not gluing anything down, but I did a test fit anyway, and it's absolutely fine, fits snugly, nothing's jamming, the body goes on back fine. Um, so what I'm going to do now is put a few extra bits of black tack along the sides just to hold it comfortably in place um, and that will be the, the speaker fixed in. Once I finish that I'll get these paired back to the wire and uh, we'll, we'll get it soldered onto the chip itself and then we'll give it a wee test run before putting everything back together again. 
Okay, so I've got the speaker fully black tacked in within an inch of its life now, so it's not going anywhere. Um, I've cut back the speaker cable uh, just a more sensible uh, um, length for, for inside the Loka, just so it doesn't get snagged in any of the workings. Um, I then paired back the, the uh, insulation sleeve and I've popped on just a, a wee bit of, uh, of heat shrink as well. Just uh, It's good to do that uh, as, as soon as possible so you don't forget a later date. So what I'm going to do now is just to uh, link up these two wires which come from the decoder, um, solder them together and then heat shrink or shrink the heat shrink over the top. Now it doesn't actually matter when you have a single speaker whether the red goes to the red and the black to the black or the red to the black and, and so on. That's, that's uh, important if you're linking things in parallel or series to make sure the polarity is right. For, but for, the, for a single one like this it doesn't really matter but I still like just to be uh, to be neat and tidy about it, uh, so I will link the red to the red and the black to the black. Um, so the way that I normally do it is just to do a little wrap round, so you've got a kind of mechanical joint there, then flow some solder over the top of it, then pop the heat shrink on and shrink that down. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'll not, uh, I'll not make you sit through that, so we'll come back once I've soldered it, once I've heat shrunk, or shrunk the heat shrunk, shrink, that's the one, heat shrink, and uh, we'll come back and then we'll give it a whiz. Okay, so that is the uh, soldering complete. The heat shrink has been shrunk. I've got it correct that time. Um, we've got the decoder hooked up into the uh, the decoder tester here. So let's just give it a wee whiz here and uh, see what it sounds like. It's working, that's a good start. Yeah, that's sounding good. Everything's working as expected. So, I should just switch that off. There we go. Silence is golden. Um, so yeah, everything's working as expected. It sounded really good. Um, it's not a huge bass reflex speaker that, but it, it gives a good uh, a good bit of power for its size anyway, and it's got a nice response to it. So certainly for a, a loco here like this one, uh, which has restricted space inside the body, it's definitely a good option. This one, um, I get this uh, direct from manufacturers in China uh, because I do loads of sound installations for myself and others, so I, I kind of buy them in bulk. But you can get similar speakers to that from a number of outlets. It's in the, in the UK as well, so there's, there's different options. Uh, but anyway, it's working well. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'll uh, disconnect the decoder tester. I will um, put a little wrap of capped on tape around the decoder itself uh, to avoid any shorting. Um, I could I could use the, the, the actual wrap that comes with it. And one of the reasons they, they do provide this is it does provide some insulation, electrical insulation, while allowing heat to dissipate. But because I use capped on tape and I only do a wrap around the midriff so the, the outsides are free so heat can dissipate, um, I do prefer to, to use the capped on tape. But if you want to go down the, uh, the Hornby, uh, Hornby rules or instructions or guidelines, they do suggest you use this and, and don't tape it up. Um, but uh, I've never had a problem, so that's what they tell you to do. So if you want to follow the instructions exactly, use something like that. Uh, but I find tape works fine for, for my purposes. Anyway, so we'll get all this disconnected, we'll get it installed, I'll get the lid back on the loco, get those uh, finicky buffers back on, and we'll give it a quick shot on the test track before we wrap the video up. Right, so one thing that crossed my mind just before I put the lid on um, and uh, plug in the, the decoder is which way round does it go? Um, now Hornby, uh, it, the Hornby fit their locomotives with a blanking plug uh, and most of their blanking plugs have the number one pin marked on them and the one, number one pin corresponds to the orange wire on the TTS decoder um, and uh, on this particular TTS there is a number one marked on it and I don't recall seeing that on all of them maybe they are, maybe I've just missed it but anyway that's quite handy but what we want to make sure anyway is and if you're using a different decoder is that the orange wire, the orange pin, goes into number one. So in this particular loco, number one is here. It is, as you're looking to the front, it is the, the first left-hand one. So that's the one we want to marry up to the orange wire. So anyway, I'll install it along those principles. Um, I've used a little bit of black tack just to hold the decoder into the body and keep it out of the way of all the gubbins. Um, so I'll get it all wired up now, stick the lid back on and crack onto the test track. Now, before I do move on, there was me getting carried away, I almost forgot. Um, in this uh, Hornby model, class 20, there's uh, not anything that uh, segregates or separates the cab 
from the, the kind of engine section on the prototype anyway. And that means when you look in the windows, you can often see the, um, the wiring and the motor and other bits and pieces. And now because of where I have installed the, the TTS chip, you would see that as well, potentially. So um, I mentioned before, maybe a bit of plastic art or something like that. Um, but I actually thought, well, tell you what, let's let's make a bit of a feature of it and, and do something a bit more. So um, I got a sketch up, up on my computer and uh, I designed uh, this little section here, which is just a, an insert, um, just to create a fake wall, I guess, between the cab and the engine section. Um, and I put on a few little bits and pieces. Um, I put on the, the warning uh, display there, some cabinets, uh, some other sort of doors and so on, some junction boxes. Um, it's very loosely based on a picture of the inside of a, a, a Class 20 cab. So, uh, I mean, it's it's not going to win any awards for precision of prototype or anything like that. But you know, it's, it, it's, it gives a little bit of a feature and gives something uh, to look at. So that was the black blank. Um, and what I then did was paint it up. So I just used acrylic paint. I used the flint grey for the grey because that's what I had to hand and a black um, and I, I painted the grey and actually flint grey is quite a good match with the inside colour on this Hornby so I painted it all in flint grey uh, and then picked out some of the details in black and then just did a slightly darker mix of grey just for some of the panel covers so I've got that it's just about dry what I'm going to do is fit it into place I think I'll probably use um, CA glue or super glue, uh, cyanoacrylate glue, whatever you want to call it, um, because it will hold it firmly in place, but it will also pop out quite easily if I ever wanted to remove it. Um, I did think about using a, a solvent cement, and because I've used PLA from the 3D printer, uh, it does work with, with good quality solvent cement. Uh, but if I stuck that in, then it's there for good. Um, so. Um, without waffling on any longer, I'm going to take this once it's dry and I'll just glue it into place there so for when you're looking into the cab, you'll not see any gubbins inside the logo itself. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know uh, that's what I've done. Um, I'll also make this available as a, a download. Um, there'll be a link in the description below. So if you've got a 3D printer, um, then you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make this available for free so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel or reinvent the wall in this case uh, and download and you can use that yourself. Okay, right, so I'll get all that together and then I'll pop the lid on and then we'll have a look at it on the test track. Excellent. Well, that's been a relatively quick project as these projects go, um, but we've got the lid back on now. We've got it uh, on the test track rolling road in place. I've got the trusty multi-mouse controller here from my uh, my Z21, the one that I use for my testing. Um, so let's give it a whiz and let's see how we get on. So let's apply some power and start her up. So I'm really quite pleased with this, I have to say. There's a, a good meatiness that's coming out of this speaker, which I, I'm not sure if it'll pick it up that well on the uh, on the video, but uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll get the impression. But really it's, um, just run through some of the functions here. Yeah, really it's, it's turned out really well. And I think that while you can squeeze in um, a larger sort of mega bass type speaker into the cab or into the rear here, um, it's quite an intrusive way to do it, and if you use this smaller bass reflex, uh, well, the results that you get are really pretty pleasing, and certainly I'm, I'm really happy with that. So I'll just switch this off. And there you have it. Um, that is the installation of a TTS, Hornby TTS Class 20 chip, sound chip, into the Hornby Class 20 locomotive. Um, as I say, it's a pretty simple project. It's a, a relatively quick project as well. Um, it's not too invasive. You can go an extra step like I did and put in a, a fake wall just to 
you know, to add to the effect if you've got a camera low down on the track and you're looking into this while it's parked up in the TMD or something like that, it really adds to that effect. Um, not seeing through into a load of wires and a can motor. Um, but anyway, um, I hope that was useful. Um, I have some other uh, videos coming up soon on the, the layout itself, so please uh, stick around uh, and keep following what I'm doing there. But uh, all that remains to be said for now is thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video. Cheerio for now. Bye-bye.